to Bits and Bytes, a television series about computers, or rather about microcomputers, the small personal ones that are selling like hotcakes nowadays. I'm Luba Goy, and I'm going to be the presenter of the information about computers that's been prepared for us by the experts. And this is Billy Van, who's going to be himself, the average person who knows nothing about computers but wants to learn. Computers seem to have crept in everywhere, haven't they? Here are some familiar scenes. You can't get away from them. And how many of us really know how they work? Well, the best way to find out is just go up to the first little computer you see and switch it on. Okay. Huh. I'll warn you now, I'm not very good at math. Well, who says computers have anything to do with math? Yeah, but to compute means to do math, doesn't it? I mean, if it has nothing to do with math, why do we call them computers? because the first people to use them happen to be mathematicians, but you can use them for anything you like. It's just that we're stuck with the name computer. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I better turn it on. The switch is at the back. Oh, really? Yeah, hey, you're right. But why is it hidden? So that you don't switch the computer off by mistake. Now, that's very smart. Well, what's this? 31,743 bytes free. What on earth is that? We'll come back to that in a minute. What matters now is that the computer is ready. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, when does it start? Is something wrong with this? Hey, do something. Come on. I'm afraid computers don't do anything on their own. You have to tell them precisely what to do step by step. You have to program them. Oh, wait a minute. I don't know how to program. You don't have to do the programming yourself. Beside you is a ready-made program you can feed into the computer. Oh, but this is just an ordinary audio cassette. Yes, it is. And you can play it on that ordinary-looking audio cassette recorder that's already plugged into the computer. Oh, okay. So, do I press play? Not yet. First, you have to tell the computer to copy the program that's on the cassette into its own storage area or memory. Well, how do I do that? Just type load, L-O-A-D. Huh. You've now finished your message, so you need to say over to you to the computer by pressing the return key. On other computers, you'll see a key marked enter, and that also means over to you. Oh, here it is. Return means over to you. Oh, and it says, press play on tape one. Okay. May I? Go ahead. You'll have to wait now while the computer searches through the cassette for the first program. I thought these things were supposed to be fast. They are fast. It's a cassette that's slow. The poor old computer can only go through a cassette at normal playing speed. Uh. Ah, finally. What it's doing now is loading or copying the word game program into its memory. Now the program is loaded, but nothing's going to happen until you tell the computer to start obeying the instructions in that program. To do that, you tell the computer to run the program. Type run and then press return. Okay. R U N return. Scramble letters. Oh, it's a word game. Great. Okay. Press space bar. What is your name? Okay. My name is B I L L Y Billy. Good luck, Billy. They're really friendly, aren't they? Okay, that's my first word. It is C O L H O S. School, school. Hey, I'm right. Okay. Second word is 
Gilco. G I L. Logic. It's logic. L O G I. Wait a minute. I'm going to spell this wrong. I want to see what the computer does. No, Billy, I'm afraid that's not it. Well, I quite agree with you. It should be L O G I. Where's the C? I got to take up typing, too. There. Right. The third word. You know, this is something else. I can't believe that all this information, words and letters, can be contained in an ordinary audio cassette. Let me show you something. Take the cassette out of the recorder and listen to it on the regular cassette machine that's beside it. Ooh, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like what's on the screen here. No, it doesn't, because that's the sound of the binary code. And what's the binary code? Let's have a look. If you lift the lid of a computer, you will see a circuit board into which a number of little boxes have been plugged. Each box contains a chip, which consists of thousands of microscopic electric circuits, each of which can be either on or off. This is the only language that the computer understands. Is one of my circuits on or off? A sequence of several ons and offs in various combinations can represent any number or letter or graphic symbol. And we can symbolize these ons and offs by using a one to stand for on and a zero to stand for off. Most computers can represent any of the symbols on their keyboards by various combinations for a total of exactly eight ones and zeros. Since this language or code is based on two digits, one or zero, just as a bicycle is based on two wheels or a biplane is based on two pairs of wings, it is called the binary code from the Latin word binarius, meaning two together. And each of the ones and zeros is called a binary digit or bit for short. So it takes eight bits to represent any keyboard character. Such a group of eight bits is called a byte. One byte is the equivalent of one character. This computer can store or remember roughly 32,000 bytes. That means you can feed a program into it that uses up to 32,000 characters, letters, numbers, or graphic symbols. Just as a kilometer is a thousand meters and a kilogram is a thousand grams, so is a kilobyte roughly a thousand bytes. This computer, therefore, has a 32 kilobyte memory, or a 32K memory for short. But the memory of most small personal computers can be extended to at least double that, 64K. This may sound a lot, but it isn't. The average page of a book contains about 2,000 characters. It's a 2K page. So even a 64K computer can only store as many characters as a 32-page book. And a 32K computer only as many as a 16-page book. Although, of course, a computer can do a lot more with its characters than a book can. But that's another story. Bits and bytes. Hmm. So this is a 32K computer, 32,000 bytes. But didn't it say something about 31,000 bytes when I first turned it on? How do I get back to the beginning? The easiest way is to just switch the computer off, then on, but... There. You see? 31,743 bytes free. But why doesn't it say 32,000 bytes free? Because the computer has to keep some in reserve for various operating functions. Well, no, it doesn't matter. I've lost my place in the word game program now. I'm sorry, but you've done more than lose your place. When you turn the computer off, you make the entire program disappear from its memory. Now you know why the on-off switch is hidden out of the way. I sure do. OK, well, how do I get back to where I was? You have to go through the whole loading process all over again. Rewind the cassette, type load, then hit return. 
then press play on the cassette recorder, then you type run and hit return. Oh, isn't there a quicker way? Yes, there is. There's an Apple computer right beside you that's already hooked up to a device for getting at ready-made programs very quickly. It's called a disk drive. Oh, all right. Uh, switch is in the back, I suppose? That's where it is. But there's nothing on the screen. No, the Apple uses an ordinary TV set and you have to turn the screen on separately. Oh, okay. Oh, here it is. Now, do you see that envelope beside the computer? Uh-huh. It contains something called a floppy disk. Take the disk out and turn it so the label is up. Make sure the slot is facing away from you. What's this? Okay. Now lift the flap on the disk drive. That's this here. Slide the disk in and close the flap. Okay, label up. There. Oh, choose a game. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Instant Zoo. I think I'll play that. Now just follow the instructions on the screen. Okay, it says press one, two, three, four. It's number one and press return. Loading Instant Zoo. This is a pattern recognition game prepared by the Sesame Street people. Oh, it sounds like fun. Instant Zoo, an animal guessing game. Okay. Here comes an animal, try to guess what it is. Okay, let me see, let me see. To see more, press return. Okay, there we go. When you want to guess the animal, press the ESC key, and that, there it is. Oh, I know what that is, I think. Fish, if it's a fish, let me see now. F-I-S-H, return. Hey, I'm right. It's a fish, and a musical one, too. Yep, it's a fish. You're really in the swim of this game. <laughs> okay, press return. And what's this animal now? When you want to guess the animal, press the ESC key. Okay, that looks like, those look like ears to me. Wait a minute. ESC, the animal is a rabbit. Okay, R, A, B, B, I, T. Hey, I'm right, it is a rabbit. Ah, well, what else is there to see? How, how can I choose another program? You hold the control key down and press the reset key. Control, hold down, reset. Boy, oh boy, this floppy disk really is fast. Can I have a look at it? Certainly, just pull the disk out. Okay. It doesn't look much like a disk. It's not round and it's not all that floppy. People are often confused when they first see a floppy disk because it doesn't even look like a disk. For one thing, it's square, not round. They're also confused by how disk drives work. So we went to Hewlett Packard and asked them to explain. A floppy disk uses a much faster method of retrieving and storing programs than a cassette. The cassette is in a much more durable package, but you have to allow for rewinding and fast forwarding to build up from one spool to the other. The floppy disk is more fragile than a cassette since the actual media is more readily exposed to the user and can come in contact with the hands and fingerprints that could cause problems. But if kept proper care of, it's a much faster and more reliable method. Inside the jacket, you'll find that there is actually a round floppy disk. It is very much like a flat circular audio tape. The material is very similar to that in a cassette tape, iron oxide metallic particles. However, the plastic is much thicker in this case. And there is a lubrication film applied. There is a small felt-like surface built into the envelope that allows the disc to slip evenly and smoothly inside the jacket. There is also a slight airflow built up by the disc turning inside the jacket. The disc itself has no physical grooves or lines on the surface. The disc is actually broken up into tracks, round tracks. 
the head steps in to each of those tracks and reads the information on them. The computer sets up a directory on the outermost track of the disk. The directory tells the computer exactly where on the disk a program would lie. This is the actual read right head. There is the electromagnet that does the reading and the writing on the surface. As we load the disk into the drive, close the door, the head comes in contact with the disk. Now, as the disk spins, the head will move across the surface of the disk. The magnetic head itself changes the polarity of the magnetic particles on the surface of the disk, the iron oxide particles. This south-north change in magnetic polarity allows the disk drive to store the information in the form of ones and zeros on the disk. The reason that the floppy disk is so much faster than a cassette is simply that you can access the entire surface of the disk with the head. At this point, we have all the advantages of a record. We can start at the beginning, and we can go directly to the end if we like. The floppy disk is just the smallest in a whole family of disks. This floppy disk is a five and a quarter inch floppy. We also have the eight inch floppy. The five and a quarter inch floppy we'll see mostly in home computers and very, very small business computers. The eight inch floppy disk is much faster and holds many times more data than the five and a quarter inch floppy. The eight inch floppy still is restricted to business computer applications. As far as hard disks go, this is a single platter, removable cartridge for a hard disk. The head never physically touches the surface of the disk. It's suspended by a very, very thin film of air. This disk can retrieve and access information at an incredible rate. A more advanced form of the hard disk is a multi-layer disk. In this particular disk pack, we have five platters that can be recorded and played back on each side of the disk, giving us 10 total surfaces to read and write on. This large five-layer disk pack has the capacity to hold as much information as almost 500 of these floppy disks. OK, so now I know how to load a ready-made program into a computer by means of disk or a cassette. Is it the same for all these computers? Yes, it is, with a few very minor variations. These are some of the most popular personal computers. You started off with a pet. Then you tried an Apple. This one is the Radio Shack. This the Atari. Behind you is the IBM personal computer. And over there is the Texas Instruments computer and the Xerox computer. They all accept programs on either cassette or disc. And they all look like typewriters plugged into a TV set. Yes, they all have a keyboard and a screen. Sometimes the keyboard has a built-in TV set, but usually you plug it into a separate TV. And computers are getting smaller all the time. This isn't a calculator, it's a computer. The Radio Shack pocket computer with a tiny built-in screen. And this one here is the Sinclair. It's the smallest and cheapest computer so far that can be plugged into a full-size TV screen. It comes with a 1K of memory but can be expanded to 16K. These are real computers, and just like the bigger ones, they're all based on the binary code. You know, when I think about it, bits and bytes and the binary code and K and all of that stuff, it really wasn't all that hard. But come on, own up. When does the heavy math start? If you want math, you can get math. But computers don't necessarily have to be involved with mathematics. You can use them for anything you like. I don't know. There's something pretty involved going on in there. It's almost as if it had a mind of its own, you know? What's really going on? This is where we come down to the essence of the computer. 
If we could distill this mysterious substance, what would we see? We'd probably see ancient Greece and Aristotle, who was the first person to write down what he called the laws of thought, or what we call logic. Now, the essence of logic is that it divides everything in life into two categories. Is it this or that? Heads or tails? Good or bad? Black or white? It must be one or the other. There are no shades of gray in logic. True or false, yes or no, on or off. Which is where the computer comes in, because its circuits must also be either on or off. The other important thing about logic is the logical argument itself, which goes something like this. All tall men are thin. Jim is a tall man, therefore Jim is thin. If the first two statements are true, we can be absolutely certain that the third statement is true. On the other hand, if there are some tall men who are not thin, then we can't be sure that the third statement is true. And in black and white logic, if we can't be sure that it's true, then it must be false. Which is where the computer comes in again because this is precisely the sort of argument that an electrical circuit likes to deal with. If we imagine one of these circuits as being like this, with a power source, a battery, two switches, and a light bulb, then we can see that the electric current from the battery can only reach the light bulb and make it light up when both switches are on. If either switch goes off, the light goes out. Now, as far as the circuit is concerned, on or off can just as easily stand for true or false. So if the first switch is statement one in our logical argument, and the second switch is statement two, and the light bulb is statement three, then only when both of the first two statements are true can the third statement also be true. But if either of the first two statements is false, then the third statement must also be false. What all this boils down to is that a computer is not a calculating machine. It's a logic machine. It doesn't so much compute things as argue about things in a strictly logical black and white fashion. So what you're saying is that these computers are nothing but a bunch of little electric Aristotles turning each other on and off? That's a good way of putting it. And what I've been feeding them by means of a disc or cassette is really a series of logical arguments? Exactly. Those two educational games you looked at were both based on logical arguments. Okay, I played a couple of games based on logic. Now, what else can the computer do for me? That's what this whole series is about. Here's a preview of what's coming up. We'll be looking at how to write simple programs. Then... Print, quotation, late, exclamation point, quotation. Don't forget the colon. Don't forget the colon. There we are. And go to 20. That is terrific. Oh. Yeah, but my program isn't finished yet, is it? Not quite. How to file information on the computer. So this program is now permanently on a disk. Type catalog and you'll see. OK. Ah, oh, hey, that's terrific. You know, I could save all sorts of things on a disk. How to get computers to communicate with each other. Now your computer will be able to hear messages and speak into the telephone itself. And this is all coming from Willowdale, Ontario? how computer languages work. In the early days of computing, there was a language barrier between computers and humans because you had to use machine language if you wanted to talk to the computer, either in binary code or its exact English equivalent. This was very slow and laborious. We'll also investigate computer graphics. Thank you. 
computer music. Processing. If I'm doing one thing such as text editing and I realize, oh, I really can't finish this document because I forgot some information, I simply want to move to a different window on the screen, search for what I want, copy it, and paste it into the original document that I was working in. And video disks. And video text systems. In the program that comes immediately after this one, we'll look at some everyday applications of the computer, how it can help you work out your finances. Why? Enter. Oh. Now press the space bar for each succeeding year. Oh, I definitely have to ask for that raise. And even help you learn French. Où est Anne? Où est Anne? This is fun. Où est Louis? Où est Louis? Can the computer understand me? We'll also have segments on the speed of the computer. If the computer could see us, to its eyes, we would appear to be moving about as fast as a lump of rock. And two different types of memory, ROM and RAM. The computer can read this left half of its memory, but it can't write on it. It can't change it. It is therefore called read-only memory, or ROM. But the computer can, in a sense, write on the other half of its memory. This half is called random access memory, or RAM. Until then, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. And I'm Billy Vance. Bye for now. <laughs>